thanks for that, that wonderful introduction, Simon. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be presenting with, with all of you here at the 30th annual um, Maya Weekend uh, in Philadelphia. I'd like to thank Loa and Simon for the invitation and also, of course, to join the chorus of general thanks and appreciation for that marvelous uh, exhibit upstairs. I mean, I was literally, um, my breath was taken many, many times during that exhibit. It was incredibly well designed and incredible pieces. So, um, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> classic Maya gods um, from a couple of different perspectives, and not solely for the, the sake of looking into um, the Maya themselves and their religion, um, although that's of course a, a key part of what I'd like to be talking about, what we can know, what we, what we were able to find out, and how about what these beings were like. And we look at them, of course, through um, a kind of fractured mirror. Um, they do shed light on our own traditions and our own religions, and that's uh, sort of the license behind this, this title slide, which we're piecing together of classic Maya religion, what they'd like to do. Now we might think, and certainly it's often um, presented in this way, that we have the Bible of Maya religion um, in the form of the Popol Vuh coming to us from the 18th century. As many of you know, this is an incredible and, and in fact irreplaceable resource for looking at Maya religion in comparative terms. But there are many other sources that are equally um, important. Um, J. Eric S. Thompson, as in so many things, really led, led the field of looking at this comparison the 60s published in 1970, which I still highly recommend. There's a lot of very, very important connections expressed there between Obobu, other hero twin traditions in other parts of the um, Maya area and in Mesoamerica. But it also reveals a huge number of changes. We have these hero twin traditions, we have them associated with complexes, we have some of them associated with solar phenomena, others associated with rains, and the Popolbu simply can't be the entire story about Maya religion, um, any more than it's the entire story, in fact, of Maya religion in the 18th century uh, when it was penned. There are tremendous um, tr uh, differences between the classic Maya art um, and the Popol Vuh. And we should welcome and celebrate this, of course, because otherwise all we really do is reify this one book that we're lucky enough to have when we look at classic Maya arts and discovering new things about these past traditions, um, where the true excitement of discovery comes from um, in looking over the shoulder these ancient scribes and artisans, largely priests, I think, uh, who produced this work for us. So we know these, these characters, hero twins, as they've been dubbed for a long time now. Um, not the Hunahu and Shpalanke of the Popol Vuh precisely, uh, but Hunahau and Yashpalun, as we know now. We don't know from the classic evidence that these two are brothers or even twins. It seems a natural enough posit since they're often shown together. But it's important to highlight um, that we simply don't have a text that calls them brothers, nor do we in fact know what their parentage is. We don't know that they're in fact related uh, to Hunishim, um, the maize god, as we know, um, in classic texts. And so the, the straightforward equation of him with Hun Hunahu, the slain father of the hero twins in the Popolu mythology, can't be taken as a given. It should rather be taken as something to be, be poked and, and prodded and explored a little bit to see what the changes might be. This has often been compared, of course, to the resurrection of Hun Hunahu that's coming from the plate famous resurrection plate from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And yet we don't have straightforward parallels. parallels. There's no maze associations. There's straightforward and evidence with Hun Hunapu and the Popol Vuh. There's no great turtle from which he's liberated in this kind of a scene associated with water. And although I think some of those associations are correct and that we see some changes when we get to the much later mythology, it's important to, to, to recognize just how many divergences and changes that we have in terms of the names of these individuals, their precise roles, and even perhaps some of their individual relationships. So it's this kind of comparative mode that I'd like to stress here. And that's actually, I think, probably the last time that I'll mention the Popol Vuh um, in terms of this talk, although undoubtedly it will come up um, in questions a little bit later on. Now, more than 100 years ago, Paul Schellhaas really led in terms of looking um, at um, the material that was available and cataloging the first examples of what we might call the classic Maya pantheon. Of course, he's part of a very, very active group German scholars, including Saylor and Furstemann and others, and we have here just a page from his publication indicating um, the gods by letters. And of course, we still have many survivals of this letter scheme. So for those of you who heard in the earlier talks and know, of course, from your own readings and interests, um, that we have gods like God El, for instance, um, God N, and others. In many cases, these terms survive because we simply do not know their ancient names. Um, in other cases, we're fortunate to have um, their ancient names. So I'm not really going to talk too much about 
God A, who's clearly a death-related um, deity. Um, but I'm going to focus, um, for the half hour that I have, I'm talking a little bit about Chach and Puch, a basic icon for God. And also this important character, um, God D, to some extent. Part of his name we know, thanks to the work by Simon Martin, reads Itzam, but there are other elements of this conflation of this all-important avian deity um, we know from pre-classic times onwards, whose name we really can't read yet. This is a character that grows up, I suppose, one might say by post-classic times, to be known as Itzam Na, but we can actually see that name change happening in terminal classic inscriptions, as Simon has pointed out. So he doesn't start that way. He becomes that deity, and there's other things that are happening effectively in between. These initial letters and associations with glyphs were, of course, recognized by Shell Haas. He couldn't read them, but he recognized when he saw the same iconography repeating and indicating these key characters over and over again in iconography that they were associated in a one-to-one -one correlation with certain name glyphs. To the extent that we can read those name glyphs, that's where we get readings like Chach and Kuch in this instance, and in part, Itzam, as we know. Some are fairly late arrivals in terms of reading. The Achan reading that I haven't, I haven't yet published, but is based on a series of phonetic substitutions and also complements that we have in several contexts. Um, Kawil, or God K, really only joined the fold in David Stewart's publication, 10 Phonetic Syllables, in 1987. So it's been a slow accretion of being able to tease these names from these letter designations. Not all of them have been with that. Now this is actually Shellhaus's example from the Dresden of what he called God C, which has been through a number of different changes or updates. It really wasn't until the late 1970s, early 1980s, that Bill Ringle noted the first key substitution um, in Diego de Landa's manuscript that gave us an indication that Ku was part of the pronunciation. And I'll show you in a moment um, what some of the more solider evidence is to make this be a logograph during pretty much all of its history in the script. Ku, literally God. Um, one of the fascinating things about this hieroglyph that's partially hidden by the way hieroglyphs hide the iconography or the origins of original signs is the hair um, that the, the being wears. Um, this marked constantly with the, the shining mark for brightness that we still don't have a solid decipherment of. Um, and we can see here in full figure examples that we get at Kofan and elsewhere that long flowing bright hair is what's signified here. I chose blue, frankly, just because I didn't want to give a Maya god hair. Sorry, I think that was really appropriate. You can imagine bright, shining hair as the core here. There's been some enthusiasm for seeing the iconography of this being as being perhaps a monkey, um, and I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's true. I think the iconography is clearly something else, something angelic, bright, um, a glowing kind of deity we see that regularly takes these markers of shininess, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. Now, this term, Kuch, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit the, the evidence for the, that particular reading and value in a moment, has a lot of derivations and a lot of context that we find it in, in my hieroglyphic writing. We have the basic noun, God. We also know and have known for some time that we have an adjectival derivation, Kuhu, godlike. It's very clear that whenever the word for God is possessed, we introduce the gods that belong to a particular king, for instance, or a particular royal house in my inscriptions. Um, that we have a spelling um, that probably targets kuhu with a final long vowel. Certainly the spelling is paradigmatically different. Instead of being followed by the lu syllable, it's consistently followed by the li, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, given parallels that we know of from ethnohistoric sources, the idols of Itza, we know but from Iran's dictionary, it seems like at least the vowel echo is part of that relational now. We also have active transitive derivations that mean to worship, and even a title. That means at least etymologically worshiper, although we're still working out what all the details are of that particular role um, in classic Mayan inscriptions. And it has a paradigmatic relationship to some colonial social sources, which refer to a <coughs> as a worshiper. Actually, the source says idolater, but of course that's through a Spanish filter in the 16th century. It's very, very clear it's an individual that worships idols in this particular context. Now, the, the phonetic evidence, um, the, the fact that it, that it behaves thoroughly as a logogram is into dispute that's very, very clear from the script context. I think it was David Stewart who first pointed out two important early classic script settings where on the back of this um, unprovenant um, little J uh, pendant, we find here a reference to Yikat's Ku, right? Um, the burden, or perhaps even the jade jewel, there's a strong correlation between this Ikat's term and jade, as David shown, of Ku, the god. Here written fully syllabically, Ku, Hu. And not as we might have expected, Chu, not that we even have that syllable, as it turns out yet, um, solidly deciphered. Um, an, interesting, an interesting development. 
Another time, Russian Glove Lintel 47, also an early classic inscription. We have a well-known title that we see almost always written in logographic form, here partly syllabically, as Ochris Khu, again, Khu, and Hu is the syllabic spelling. Now, it may be significant that both of these syllabic substitutions are early. They might actually predate a change, at least in writing, which might be a much more, you know, much uh, belated update from K to Ch within the writing system, even though we know that this should have happened a lot earlier in the languages per the historical linguistic reconstruction. Another possibility to be entertained and something that I'm doing in a, in a paper um, that's forthcoming with Daniel Law and uh, David Stewart, Stephen Houston, and John Robertson is the idea that maybe this K to Ch, K to Ch change, which we see as characteristic of Chalwa and Sultana, may have been an aerial change taking place during classic times. It's possible maybe that that hieroglyphic evidence gives us some evidence of a change that's not actually genetic for that whole family, but something that's spread like <laughs> Not to do that again, sorry. Sorry by contact through this region. The context of these things are clearly titular. So we have here an array of gods. Um, Dave showed this image just a little bit earlier on. Um, all gathered on Forahawi Kumkhu. And again and again, we have their, their known names, like Bolonokte with Ku as a title. Um, Oshpulud, perhaps, Ku. Hawantechi, Ku. Such and such the god, such and such the god, over and over again, clarified as being this, this particular title or entity. We have uh, lengthier inscriptions, like Peter Snicker's panel two, um, here from the, uh, the Peabody Museum um, of Anthropology um, at Harvard University, where we have a nice scene dated to um, 658 AD, um, where we have um, an association of the king um, effectively receiving helmets in subservience from a large number of <coughs> subordinates. Um, that's done in the presence of Ukuhu, of his gods, Yichnal, before them, and then a long list of these deities, which include these interesting fellows, Hun Panak Ak, Washak Panak Ak, and others along those lines, as well as variants of Chak and others. So this important association is actually overseen in these particular instances by gods. And Stephen House and David Stewart have written compellingly about this important role of deities in oversight. What's important on this particular panel is that this later event from the time period of the making of the panel is contrasted with a much earlier event in 510 AD, about 150 years earlier, where the oversight was actually conducted by a foreign lord. In other words, the, the substitution there is between this foreign lord of immense power and the local patron gods about 150 years later. So it's an interesting um, juxtaposition of authority in those contexts. Now, um, a series of um, pendants, 32 in number, um, that were excavated by Ricardo Armijo um, in 1998 in Comalcalco um, from um, an urn in its north plaza have a series of annual um, uh, bloodletting ceremonies that are done by an individual who carries the Avkak title, I think almost certainly a, a priest or certainly a ritual practitioner of some kind, um, all in the presence of various aspects of Chach, the rain god. We see him here, it was very, very characteristic. The, the earliest um, discovered um, spelling was named Cha and Ki. Um, we've known about that spelling for a long time in the codices and elsewhere, but we see all these terms that come from. Um, late, late 8th century, 771, 772, in that particular neighborhood. All of this is done, this bloodletting ceremony, before or in front of an aspect of the god Chak, who is the god of Ukuhul Ahpakaltan, that was named, named twice. This is something that recurs on many of these pendants, one after another. Um, annual events falling in uh, 10 C. This is March, um, late March, in fact, not, not too far away, um, of course, um, from the, the vernal equinox. Now, um, other important connections and places where we see this kind of imagery and this particular title and association um, navigated um, are, for instance, the very, very important <coughs> classic murals discovered by William Saturno at San Bartolo. Um, the San Bartolo murals, has been said several times, are like a Sistine Chapel of the Maya, and it really has led to a sea change in how we see um, Maya religion. Um, I think solidly following Carl Talba that 10 or 20 years from now, we'll look back to a time to just before the discovery of the San Bartolo murals and just after it as being an important demarcation of what we knew about narratives of the Maya religion. Um, and we see some of that expressed here. The emergence, of course, of this first family, as Faltavia has compellingly written, with the first food and the first water and a gourd out of the underworld cave or out of the cave is an important narrative that cross-cuts many Mesoamerican traditions and even we find it outside in the American Southwest. 
we know of these kinds of emergences from caves and these rural migrations from other parts of Mesoamerica, here from the Codex Platarini, where we have the Mexica and other Aztec tribes leaving Aztlan and carrying, here are all the Teonomasque, or the god carriers, um, idols of their gods or bundles of their ancestors. There is little Huitzilopochtli with his hummingbird headdresses, <coughs> one day destined to grow up to become the patron god of Mexica of Tenochtitlan. Here, here he can be carried in a little bundle. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the same thing, of course, here, as Carl and others have recognized. If we close up on these two fellows, we get a little bit less description uh, fairly often, even the maze god, all that other incredible iconography on this side. They're important in several different ways. For one thing, they're attired very, very differently. Um, they're the only individuals on this wall that are associated with hieroglyphs, whether with them or whether the hieroglyphs belong to the bundles above them, I think hard to say. There are certainly things that are qualified as being vivid, alive, having essence, even speaking. Um, whereas these fellows have gags on their mouths, right? It's not them who speak or better to be heard from, but, but the bundles that they're carrying. And if we close up specifically on the iconography that we have up here, we recognize a very, very familiar um, icon, even at this early remove. This is the, the image that we see attached to each of these bundles carried by the god bearers. And these are just a series of very closely related icons, sharing in some instances the same iconography, and in later instances probably an outgrowth the same sign, leaving open for the moment the possibility that what we're looking at here is a complex icon that gets divided later on within the history of Maya writing and iconography, or whether we're already looking at an intensively conflated form, which is related paradigmatically to all of these later ones. The amount of shared elements along the sign, so the sign group is fascinating, right? We have here, of course, from, from coming up with Walter 10, and from the Palenque sarcophagus, these large versions of this brightness sign, Shiner. I believe he was dubbed once uh, by, by David Stewart and uh, Carl Tauba. Also, of course, the sign Kuch, God, um, images that you've seen um, just a little bit previously. Simon Martin, I know, has been working as well with the idea that this particular icon is paradigmatically related to these, perhaps an icon for God, certainly again in this important relationship. And even the, the way that the eye of this particular shining bright being that we're looking at back here at San Bartolo, and here, sorry, from the Kich Pan Pahon, relatively uh, contemporaneous. Um, is itself reiterated and repeated in the keen or the sun sign. These associations then between you know, solar light, God, and also just brightness or shininess are fascinating ones to contemplate in this early imagery. The great sea ball mask that was uncovered, of course, by Francisco Estradabelli has some of this iconography in spades. And if we take a close look at that mask, we can see that it shares almost all of the important diagnostic attributes that this sign does in San Bartolo. In other words, those mummy bundles, or those bundles at least, let's not load the question too much, of, of, uh, they're obviously you know, religious icons or effigies in some way, have a direct relationship to this large mask that's at the site of sea ball. Again, more or, less, more or less contemporaneous. Now there's a couple of different ways to think about that association, but what struck me, of course, was the term that we regard, you know, knowing the lowland Maya language as well as we do, and seeing them represented in writing, and so often, of course, in the Yucatec sources that are most available most people. Ku, and then of course Chu, the Cholan and Tzeltalan version of that term, mean God. And even some Eastern Mayan languages, like Kekchi, who've had long-term associations with these lowly Mayan languages, have that meaning, that core meaning for this term. But if we go wider in the Maya family, we recognize that the cognate term means day or sun, and in some of the languages, lightning, as we see specifically here. In order, in order to reconstruct Proto-Mayan, we have to take account of these divergences and differences, right? It won't do to reconstruct it back to Proto-Mayan, a term that meant God, day, sun, lightning, right? <coughs> um, something happened in order to separate out those important key terms. And chances are, particularly given a comparative perspective, which I'll share with you in just a second, that what we're looking at is a term that meant brightness of the sky. And that that term was instantiated in different Mayan traditions as sun, good example of the sky, day sky generally, and in other traditions is actually a holy object to God. That's where the term God comes from, in the bright things. <coughs> Those of you who know anything about the comparative mode, for instance, Mesopotamian religion, we know that Dingir, of course, the Sumerian term that means God, is itself from the term for star, or bright light in the sky. One doesn't have to go far to see other shining exemplars of the beginning of this kind of deity tradition. Fordson writing about Proto-Indo-European language and culture in 2003, 
It says, given that gods were in the first instance celestial beings in the Indo-European view of the cosmos, it is not surprising that the most securely reconstructable members of the Proto-Indo-European pantheon had to do with the sky and the <coughs> phenomena. The general word for god is a derivative of a root meaning shine. Right? That should sound familiar. <laughs> as of the bright sky. Its descendants include such words as Vedic Devas, Latin Deus, Old Irish Dia, and Lithuanian Dievas. Right? All of these terms meant originally brightness or shine and became the <coughs> But it actually penetrates a little deeper than that. The same root for shine furnished the name of the head of the Proto Indo European pantheon, the god called literally Father Sky, whose name is securely reconstructable from the exact equation of the Vedic Sanskrit, Yaus Pitar, Father Sky. Greek Zeu, Pater, Father Zeus, and Latin Jupiter, um, Jupiter, literally Father Jove in origin. All of these originally meant effectively Father Sky. Right? Um, that's fascinating that Jupiter is the same word as Zeus' father, is in fact the same word as, of course, the Sanskrit term for this great being of the sky. Even Germanic, <coughs> this, this root, Tiu, right? <coughs> the name of one of the early runes that were used, Futhor, later Futhor, um, was a cognate of this term. Right? Well, we have a, a clear cognate for this particular being, all apart even from the basic icon of God, right, or bright object of the sky. God D emerges as that, that particular being. A little bit harder to see here in his much, much later incarnation where we find him in the Dresden Codex. Um, but we regularly see this being up in the sky, right? Here, seated on a sky band, his body labeled with brightness markings. These are the God markings, so long ago identified iconographically by Michael Coe. Now we know specifically a marking of the body is shiny, right? Um, here is associated with the, the moon goddess. The weather as a daughter, the weather as a consort, it's hard to say from the context we see it in. There's no hieroglyphs linking them in those specific ways. We also have this text, first interpreted by David Stewart, which indicates that G1, an unfortunate moniker, we can't fully read his name. Chach is part of it, um, but we can't read the rest of that particular name, is seated you know, back in the deeps of time. Um, and the individual who's responsible for this is an aspect of God D. The event is explicitly said to take place in the bright sky, right in the midst of the bright sky. That's his association. Um, the hummingbird vessel, of course, famously um, from Burial 196 at Tikal, um, has a, a couple of scenes which show part of the role of this sky god, right? This old, old father sky, if you will, associated with, with the heavens and with the bright sky. Um, the hummingbird approaches him, you know, feeling effectively a regrettable lack of wings, right? In the next scene, we actually see a, a nice jar out there and a hummingbird that has all of his wings. It's part of a series of just so stories that we see in my iconography, explaining that this really is a kind of creative principle that work in the sky. He's the individual who explains, in this instance, where the hummingbird gets his wings. In this scene, what we seem to be having is a, a swap deer bringing tamales so that they can get their antlers. Right? <laughs> Many of these wonderful scenes where we have, you know, the Kawati associated with God D, right? Um, and still other beings. Many of them we don't understand as well as we understand these two scenes. And they're, of course, the God again, slathered in shininess up in a, a, a stairway to heaven, effectively. He's an individual who's up in the sky, in the stars, right? He's very, very familiar in that way. Remember the associations of lightning and brightness specifically, of course. This is the Jupiter of Smyrna, um, the aged God, uh, who, as we know now, um, his name actually derives from brightness and these associations with the sky as well, here holding um, his famous lightning bolt. There are other gods um, whose names and also traditions and behavior are susceptible to a deeper understanding through comparison. Chach is a great example. This comes again um, from David Stewart's 1987 publication. Um, Chach on the mountain. This is actually the substitution, you know, visual with association that helped lead to the elites. I uh, decided it was one step that chain of argument for mountain. Um, again, here with this cha ki spelling, that's all important in terms of us figuring out what the phonetics are of that name. We don't have to call him God D anymore, but what does it mean that we can call him cha? Well, we know that that term, cholo, in its basic form, right, um, is associated with a whole list of other terms that refer to thunder primarily, instantiated as rain in some traditions, so this means equally thunder and also rain in modern Yucatec. Um, and they go back to a word in Proto-Mayan, kahok, thunder, right? What's fascinating is that Yucatec clearly borrowed, you know, from a Cholan language, 
most likely the one that was most closely associated with Maya hieroglyphic writing, a prestigious language. Um, the term chalk, and they even enshrined the H that it used to have with a high tone in that, in that particular language. And they had it alongside their own actual inherited term, Kalwak, which only survives really as the 19th day name, you know, iconography, iconographically, those terms are associated. So Kalwak is the direct descendant of Kahok, Cha, only because it's come through Cholam um, into, into Yucatecan. What's fascinating about this is that this is therefore a god whose name literally was Thunder, and it became specialized enough that there could exist two separate terms for effectively the same idea, although I'll be a house in slightly different semantic terrains in Yucatec specifically. This should be immediately straightforward um, when we think about Thor, right? The Norse god of thunder and lightning. His name literally simply means Thor. It's an expected change within Old Norse from the Proto-Germanic Thunderous <coughs> thunder, which we have, of course, as a, a cognate in English, thunder, and also German Donner, right? So the two names of the reindeer, Donner and Blitzen, right? It's fun thunder and lightning, which are great names, great names for reindeer. Yeah. Thor is pulled in a chariot um, by several goats, and he carries, of course, his great hammer, Mjolnir, um, which was forged by the dwarves in the deeps of time, right? This amazing, amazing weapon. Um, and its name, actually, Mjolnir, is a cognate of, a cognate of our word mallet, right? But it's also cognate to words in English like mill, Right, for grinding things, and meal, grinding bones to meal, maul, right? <laughs> and even to maul, to chew things over. You know, all those are related. Yeah, Mjolnir, very, very interesting, interesting weapon. Um, and pulled in a rattling chariot, loud, thunderous. This is all part of the explanation of who, who Thor is. Um, Chalk, too, of course, as we know, wields a mallet, right? And his mallet is to that um, Kawil, right? The other, other lightning god, because there's a relationship between the two of them. I've long had um, a suspicion that maybe at the root of the word kawil might find a word that meant, you know, hammer, pound, or something like that, but I've had no luck. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows anything and suggest it to me. Um, but it'd be nice to find an etymology for kawil. Not necessarily just explain this, but to reveal something of where that particular name came from. This is Chalk, of course, in his early classic visage. He still has iconography of clouds and thundery skies um, up in his headdress. We see him in art, also bright, shining. You know, there's a reason that Michael Coe called these god markings, of course. We see him not just with his spondyl shell ear, ear flare and his lightning weapons, but he's also here, um, a jagged you know, line of lightning or thunder, or very, very loud and thunderous no, uh, noise comes out of the mouth of the being in this particular case. Now we know um, that the iconography of chalk is encompassing um, in the sense that we have kings dressed as chalk we also, in this scene, as we know from Karen Bassey's work, see a child, um, Kan Hoi Chi Tam, you know, 10, 11 years of age. And he's here, actually dressed as an aspect of chalk, with a tiny little water jar, the Akkab sign that's on it for darkness, marks the dark storm ring of waters that he carries. This has a very, very strong relationship to imagery that we know of in the Aztec area in ethno history. So, for instance, in Offering 48 of the Temple Mayor, we have all of these little water jars um, that were excavated at that site. And beneath them, of course, we have all the little faloques. These were children that were actually dressed as this particular rain deity, very, very similar to the same that we see um, in the Maya area um, with Khan Hoi Tam, but here, of course, sacrificed along the way towards making rain. So these are sacrifices effectively to Tlaloc, right? A kind of lichen kind offering that's given in that particular area. And we don't have evidence for that specific kind of child or infant offerings in the Maya area, but we do have Good imagery, like for instance this one which comes from a mythological scene off of an unprovenance vessel of children in graziers. And that scene I showed you earlier of chalk thundering, lightning and thunder coming out of his mouth, also shows an infant sacrifice, a paradigmatic mythical theme of a baby jaguar, Simon Martin and others have written about. Now this should be familiar, of course, that infant sacrifice, you know, particularly within a comparative perspective, is something that we understand well from cultures around the world. We know from Genesis, of course, Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, or of course from, from um, um, the Islamic tradition, of course, of Ishmael, but of his son, right? So the near sacrifice, his willingness to offer up a child to God, right? This isn't the only instance um, within the Bible where we see the perhaps uh, best interests of children subordinated somewhat to the demands and requirements of faith, right? And this is still cited as a parable of a great man of faith, right? He's, of course, halted at the last moment. The attempt was just to see whether he would be willing, in fact, to do it. 
But as a father, I have a hard time reading this passage or thinking about it and, and thinking, you know, that I would be willing even to, to hold up the knife, even fully hoping, knowing that the deity would allow me to offer it up. Now, this is fairly remote. It's in the past. This kind of thing isn't New Testament, of course, right? But we do find instances of the best um, sort of possible outcomes for children being subordinated to the needs of faith, even in modern traditions, right? In the United States today, effectively, in 35 states of the US, we actually have concessions made to religious beliefs where the, 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 the CAPTA requirements, right, for child neglect and child abuse are um, allowed to get a free pass or a free ride as long as, you know, faith healing or prayer is something that's allowed to be, uh, be cited. A two-year-old boy is allowed to bleed to death, easily treated with cut. A two-year-old girl with a treatable bowel obstruction is left in agony for several excruciating days finally dying only after vomiting fecal matter. If, the, if, you, if you can stomach reading more about this kind of thing in the way that it's still happening you know, across the US, um, you should read Sean Francis Peter's book, When Prayer Fails, Faith Healing with Children and the Law. There are still children within the contemporary US who are effectively sacrifices to faith, right? Not necessarily in precisely the same way that we see in comparative cultures, but it shines kind of a harsh light on modern traditions. All apart from, from neglect or the special category, we also have all too real and all too close examples of cases where the metaphysics of martyrdom, right, particularly in the kind of pre-enlightenment fundamentalist and literalist um, interpretation, collide sharply with the requirements of living in multicultural, pluricultural societies in the modern era, right? One of the things that we can learn from understanding that this kind of an act was perpetrated by individuals who had strong and unshakable faith that they were doing the right thing for a set of religious guidelines is that it does shine some light back on the requirements of living within uh, a tradition where we have many other religions with slightly different fundamental beliefs and aspirations, all effectively housed within the same modern nation states. So there has been a lot of question as to whether or not the Maya pantheon is a true pantheon whether we're looking at actual deities here, I think the epigraphic and linguistic evidence strikingly confirms the fact that we are looking at gods, we are looking at an organization of these deities, and they have the same kinds of evolution and associations that we see etymologically and paradigmatically when we look at religions from other parts of the world. Even more importantly, what we see when we look at all of these gods and their cults and their histories is beings to whom um, large amounts of public art and architecture were reared, Right? A tremendous artistic tradition you know, grew up around the worship of these beings and also their associations. It's perfectly right and correct to celebrate the achievements of that particular tradition. But it's also important to unflinchingly look at what we might consider, you know, particularly from a modern perspective, the kinds of cons of that kind of association. Um, and all too often we kind of give a, a blank check to the kinds of things that happen when we have unshakable belief in you know, the existence of deities that today you know, apart from one exemplar, have been entirely forgotten and have to be you know, completely uncovered by the archaeologist's spade.